Morning, church. How is everyone this beautiful day? Are you blessed? Once more, are you blessed? Amen. Well, it's so good to see each and every one of you. We are so thankful for for you to be here and being part of this service this morning. But uh, can I just give a quick testimony of what God has been doing, especially over these past couple of weeks? We have been diving into this series uh, a journey through the book of Luke. And God has just been doing amazing things in our hearts and in our lives as we just seek him as a church family. Uh, we had our two-night event. It was amazing. And this past Sunday, we gave an emphasis on healing and deliverance. And can I just say that God did amazing things. Amen. All across campuses, we've heard testimonies of people that were needing healing and God just moving in their lives, people that were delivered from addictions, people bringing drug paraphernalia and leaving it at the altar and just trusting God. And so God is continuing to do great things even today. Amen. Amen. We are so thankful for that. So if you have your Bibles, we are diving into Luke chapter 10. If you have your devotionals, there's a spot for you to take notes, or you can take notes on your phone, as well as the Stone Church app. There are sermon notes that you can follow along um, with the message. But this morning, we are in Luke chapter 10. I've said this before, but I'm so thankful that we live in an ag community. All of the agriculturalists, we, we just want to thank you, everyone that works or takes some part. There's so much sacrifice, whether it's time away from family um, or it's just physical strength, whatever mental space that you give to your work to help really bring food to all of our tables. And we are so thankful for you. Um, I remember growing up, I would help my brother-in-law, who's a foreman at a pear field here locally. And we'd go out in August. And it was always kind of like the time of year for my brother-in-law, especially because that was the main harvest that he worked in. And so around my brother-in-law's family um, uh, my, and my sister's family, they were very focused on that during the month of August. But wouldn't you know it, they had a child in the month of August. <laughs> and so every August, they play this, this game like, when is harvest coming and when do we get to celebrate my nephew? And I don't think he's ever celebrated on his actual birthday. <laughs> because when harvest time is ready, how many of you know that you have to be ready? When harvest time is ready, and church, can I tell you that there's a harvest that we get to be part of? We're not going to put on gloves and boots and go out and work right now. But there's a harvest that Jesus invites us to. And it speaks on this in Luke chapter 10, verse 1 through 16. So if you have your Bibles, we are getting started here. We're going to read quite a big portion of chapter 10 here right now. This, after this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. He told them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Go, I am sending you out like lambs among wolves. Wow. Do not take a purse or bag or sandals. Do not greet anyone on the road. When you enter a house, first say peace to this house. If someone who promotes peace is there, your peace will rest on them. If not, it will return to you. Stay there, eating and drinking whatever they give you, for the worker deserves his wages. Do not move around from house to house. When you enter a town and are welcomed, eat what is offered to you. Heal the sick who are there and tell them the kingdom of God has come near to you. But when you enter a town and are not welcome, go into its streets and say, even the dust of your town we wipe from our feet as a warning to you. Yet be sure of this, the kingdom of God has come near. I tell you, it will be more bearable on that day for Sodom than for that town. Woe to you, Corazon. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Tyre or Sidon, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes, but it will be more bearable for Tyre and Sidon at the judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, will you be lifted to the heavens? No, you will go down to Hades. So previous to chapter 10, Jesus has gathered his disciples and he's really given them a similar assignment to what we just read. He has sent them out to preach the good news that the kingdom of God is near. And he sends them out and, and they see miracles. They see signs and wonders. And 
they just uh, have done a powerful thing. And so Jesus now, before he goes to certain towns, he gathers up 72 people. Some manuscripts um, say that it's 70. It might be 70 because we've seen this, this number in a pattern throughout scripture. We see it in the book of Daniel, uh, described as the 70, uh, uh, 70 years in captivity, as well as the 70 weeks that he sees. It, it's just seen many times throughout the scriptures. So some scholars believe it was probably 70 that Jesus sent out. Either way, Jesus takes this great group of people and he sends them out to, to really preach. We're not talking about a harvest that we will eat or consume, literally, but this is a harvest. This is a, a people that are ready and need to hear of the gospel of Jesus. And he really sends them out to, to preach this. The kingdom of God is coming before Jesus actually arrives to those towns. And he sends them out two by two, kind of how he sent out the disciples. And he really does this one for companionship, um, but also just uh, to be on the safe side. But theologically as well, in the book of Deuteronomy, it talks when there is uh, to be a warning or condemnation, like a judgment on somebody, there needed to be at least two people uh, as, as to be witnesses with one another. And so Jesus sends them out two by two. And right before he sends them out, though, he huddles them up and he gives just an amazing team huddle speech. One of the greatest ever, right? He gathers them up. He's like, look, the harvest is plentiful. Now farmers love to hear that word. The harvest is plentiful. But unfortunately, Jesus says the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. There's so many people that need to hear about the good news of Jesus. But unfortunately, there are not enough people to do it. And so what does Jesus say? Well, you need to pray and ask the Lord of the harvest to send out more workers. So he says, instead of complaining, come to God and pray that God would equip more people to go out and share the message that he's giving them. But not only that, but Jesus is implying that they themselves, the 72 or 70, are the workers themselves. So he's sending them out. And he says this, this is the first line of motivation that he gives them. Go, I am sending you out like lambs among wolves. How awesome is that? He's saying, I'm sending you out like lambs amongst wolves. Now, I'm not a biologist or an animal expert, but I'm pretty sure that is not a good combo. Lambs among wolves, and especially for the lambs. And that was him. But Jesus really wants to make them aware of what's happening, the mission that they are about to go do. It was one that would at times would be dangerous. People wouldn't accept them at times. Perhaps they'd be hostile to them with their words, but even physically. And so Jesus doesn't want them to be gullible, but to be wise of the situation that is surrounding them at this time. Not only is this, the, the mission kind of dangerous, but it also needs haste. Now, I got to admit, before I got married, when I'd go on a trip or go on a road trip or go out of town, I was not like the greatest person for packing, right? I, I don't make lists. I just start throwing stuff in my suitcase. And many times we'd get to our destination and I'd either forget a toothbrush, toothpaste, uh, deodorant. Unfortunately, one time even underwear. The uh, funniest one I forgot was pants, all right? Like I'm wearing, it wasn't wearing pants of course, but I had shorts on and, and for the occasion, it was not the best thing. And so I had a friend that was a little bit bigger than me. Okay, a lot of bit bigger than me at the time. And uh, I had to borrow his pants and they, I look like a, just like a, a, a cholo from the 90s, right? Like, <laughs> be honest. And I tied it with a rope. It was the funniest thing. But I'm so thankful for my wife because she has drastically changed the way I pack. Or rather, rather I say she packs for me, right? But we bring up just about everything. She, she makes me pack about five outfits per day, right? Uh, uh, shoes to match. There's, I have to pack extra and then extra, just in case the extra runs out. I mean, there's snacks, there's medicine, water, probably enough water to fill the car too. I mean, we could live out of our suitcase and car for about a month, right? But she has drastically changed that in my life. But Jesus says, you know what? The mission is so important that I'm sending you on that you don't even have time to pack extra stuff. Take whatever you have and hit the road. He says, there's, it, that's the importance of it. How many times have you taken off somewhere and you, you forget about stuff because the, you just got to get somewhere? 
And Jesus just says, like, you guys have no time to prepare. You got to go now. It's imminent. The kingdom of God is near. And he says, you don't even have time for chit-chat or conversation. My wife always uh, is wary of us running into people, not because she's embarrassed or doesn't want to say hi to people. It's because I tend to talk a lot when I see somebody that I know. But Jesus is like, there's no time for that. You got to go and get to the place where you're going because the message you bring is one of hope. He actually encourages them that they would go and what they would do would to be shared that the kingdom of God is near and to heal the sick. And so Jesus says, unfortunately, there will be situations where people won't accept the message that you are bringing. But through their, their hospitality, you will know if it is accepted or it is not. He says, if you speak peace and they say peace back, he says, stay there, enjoy some food, hang out at their house. Don't go from house to house, stay there, hang out. If a town dismisses you, uh, and this was a tradition back in those days, but he says, basically, wipe the dust off your shoes, continue on. Now, but when I was younger, I was in a, uh, in a band, but we did not only just play music, but we would go to churches and conferences and play worship music. And what I loved about traveling to Hispanic churches is they always had food after every event, right? And it wasn't catered food. It was catered quality, but it was homemade food. But in Mexico, although there are very similar dishes, each one kind of does its own thing. They eat, a certain, eat it a certain way. And so uh, how many of you love tamales? Yeah, I know the people of Wapato really love tamales because they have a whole festival for it, right? <laughs> Amazing. But we show up and we get to the dining room and I, I was playing drums at that time and man, I'd really go for it, right? And so I'm sweating, and it's hot, we were tearing down and, and we get in and it's about 80 degrees in this small room and we are sitting like back to back on, on tables and it's just hot and I'm dying in there. I ask for water and and they bring out food, and I'm like, oh, hopefully something, you know, good. Of course, they bring out tamales, but they also bring out what's like a hoagie bun or some type of bread, and it's the, tam the tamale and the bread. <coughs> I'm like, okay, this is weird. What do I do? I know how to eat the tamale, but what am I supposed to do with the bread, right? And I proceed to see people uh, slice it open, and they put, put the tamale inside, and they're like, don't forget the salsa. And so I'm like, okay, I'm going with it, right? Uh, sure, I'll eat it. It was amazing. But they're like, don't forget the salsa. Well, this was the hottest salsa I've ever tasted. And so it's 80 degrees. I'm sweating, and I'm eating the hottest salsa I ever could. But you know what? I'm like, I'm just thankful. I'm starving. I'll take it, right? And I eat it away. But Jesus is like, whatever they offer you, don't expect, you know, a five-star hotel treatment. Just be glad that you're on this mission. Just take what you get. And so he says, enjoy the food. And it really wasn't about the food. It was about the conversation, the camaraderie, the fellowship that they had at the table. Powerful things happen when we come together and even just spend time together. And so Jesus encourages them to do that. But he also gives them this, that if they are to be rejected, unfortunately, he gives them the encouragement to give warning to them. But the message that he gives to them is a powerful one. He says, heal the sick who are there and tell them the kingdom of God has come near to, near to you. All these instructions and warnings were for this very purpose. This was the sole core of the mission to heal the sick and preach Jesus. What a powerful message that is. And church, we believe that Jesus still does the same, not only physically, but spiritually. Jesus heals and Jesus saves. And the kingdom of God is near to us as well. In fact, it lives in us as we accept Christ. This is what we continue to preach as a church, that the Messiah has come and he saves. But unfortunately, many people rejected. We see this as a common trend in the book of Luke, unfortunately. People either contest or just dismiss, dismiss it. And Jesus says this, it, it's more bearable for Sodom in that day than those towns that would dismiss it. Now, in the book of Genesis, Sodom and Gomorrah were these two, these places where they were rather kind of evil places. There was a lot of sin and evil things going on, and they had rejected God. And unfortunately, the Bible says that fire and brimstone came down, right? Uh, 
scholars actually have gone to this region and have found sulfur uh, in this area. And it seems like it just fell from heaven. But unfortunately, uh, those people were destroyed. And so Jesus says it's more bearable for them than these now small towns that have rejected the good news of Jesus. It's unfortunate. They themselves don't bring the condemnation, but they give a warning to it. And church, sometimes I, th I think we can miss out on the message that God brings us at certain times in our lives. And I'm not saying it to condemn or to give warning, but what does that look like when Jesus is trying to speak to us? Perhaps as we scroll past a verse that is popping out to us, perhaps somebody's trying to give a word of advice, biblical advice to us, and we listen, but we don't take it. Perhaps there's a message that you heard on Sunday that really speaks to your heart and you contemplate it, but don't hold on to it. And sometimes us ourselves, we look at these people like, how can you miss out on God's kingdom coming to you? How can you miss out on an opportunity for your healing? How can you miss out on the opportunity of being saved? But sometimes we miss out. We dismiss when God is trying to speak to us or when he sends someone to us. But unfortunately, as I said, some of these people would reject the message of Jesus. And so Jesus has sent these 72. He had done so similarly also in chapter nine, but really the, the word that is used here is apostolo, which is Greek for I am sending you. Of course, Jesus had a special calling on the 12 apostles as they were sent out, but here these 72 are now sent out also Although they are not his disciples or apostles, they carry the same message and they walk in the same power and the same message of Jesus Christ. And church, I believe that this is also for us today. We may not be apostles or his 12, one of his 12 disciples, but we carry on that same, same message, that same vision that Jesus gave to them. And that's why we do these things. That's why we've come out here uh, and that's why we believe in Vision for the Valley. It's to carry on this, message, mess, this mission that Jesus has given the church. Matthew chapter 28, verse 18 through 20 says, this all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Many times we, we think that, you know, God has sent certain people. He certainly sent missionaries to go to certain places. Pastor Larry, who is kind of the lead, he is the lead on our missions department. We have a nickname for him on staff, and that's Larryanna Jones. Because he's truly experienced some crazy things. I mean, being face to face with the rhino, um, he's had every disease that you could think of, uh, malaria several, several times, and he's been held at gunpoint by uh, uh, guerrilla warriors, right? That's not at guerrillas with guns. It's the type of warfare, right? But they were <laughs> soldiers <laughs> with guns, right? I thought that. I pictured that in my head. I'm like, I hope they don't think what I'm thinking right now, right? But the guerrilla warfare, of course, that's the way they, they fight. But He's experienced this. And sometimes we think, yeah, there's man, God has certainly called special people for his mission. But we are no less called than the superstars and the people we look up to. We are all called to be part of this mission. The 72 were probably people just surrounded, that surrounded Jesus and they were maybe close to him and he was able to reach out to them. And he chose them and he invited them to be part of this amazing mission. In church, we continue with that on in our lives and here as a church, collectively, as a church. The message of Jesus is powerful. In Acts chapter two, verse 42 through 47, it says, they devoted themselves to the apostles, <coughs> teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of the bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles, all the believers were together and had everything in common. 
They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. How did they fulfill this amazing mission? This is now a time later on. Jesus had died. He rose again. He hung out with them for about 40 days. And then he ascended to heaven and he has now sent down his Holy Spirit. And so they, this is a time later in this church. Now this is the mission. And this is how they were accomplishing that mission. Number one, they... They followed the teaching of the disciples. They paid attention to God's word and they took it seriously. Not only that, but they came and had a fellowship. They hung out around food. What an awesome thing, right? But not only that, but as they took God's word, as they lived it out, as they had fellowship and, and came together with many things in common, they lived in unity. They were also compassionate to the poor but not just the poor, but to all those that had need. And church, as we talked about earlier in hosting and as we shared the past couple of weeks, we get to continue on as the church in sharing this compassion. We have a list of some of the things that we'll be doing. How many of you love coffee and donuts? I do, right? Yeah. Well, we are so thankful for uh, the staff of our local schools can we just give a hand to all the staff, the teachers, <laughs> teachers, assistants, parapos, those that work um, in the medical help and especially admins. It, it is not easy to be a teacher. Can I tell you that? I've seen it firsthand. I used to work in a, in a school for a couple years as a parapro and I've seen the, the, the load that they carry, but can't we just make their day with a coffee and donut? We have some other stuff. We have essentials. For the homeless, those that are in need, it's, it's getting cold out there and we want to provide them with uh, perhaps gloves, uh, maybe a, a beanie with some treats and a backpack. Also, we'll be volunteering at the Triumph Center, uh, especially the, the men's facility here in Buena. <coughs> we will adopt a block in helping a neighborhood clean it up, uh, whether it be their leaves or the sidewalks, whatever it may be. Uh, we will spend time with residents at Emerald Care uh, it's a nursing home and rehabilitation center. Um, and also we will be providing lunch for our neighbors, right? We're called to love our neighbor as a self. Well, let's get started right here with our neighbors here at Astria, All right? We're gonna provide lunch for them. So there are several opportunities that we get to uh, just provide need and just to love people and to care for one another as God has called us to. Verse 17 through 24. We're almost close to the end here. So if you didn't pay attention to the first half, I invite you to pay attention to at least this last part. <laughs> Verse 17, the 72 returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. And he replied, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. And I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. And nothing will harm you. However, do not rejoice that spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. And at that time, Jesus, full of joy through the Holy Spirit, said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned and reveal them to little children. Yes, Father, for this is what you were pleased to do. All things have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows who the Son is except the Father. And no one knows who the Father is except the Son. And those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Then he turned to his disciples and said privately, Blessed are the eyes that see what you see. For I tell you that many prophets and kings wanted to see what you see, but did not see it and to hear what you hear, but did not hear it. Growing up, I went to many camps and conferences as a child and in, in my teenage years and youth group, and we were always given the opportunity to come back and give a testimony. 
And my friends and the people from church, would they would not bet, but they would uh, see who was right and would bet to see if I would cry. Because I'm a very emotional guy. I got to admit it. And almost every time I'd be like, oh, Jesus was so awesome, right? He, he, people were crying and, and he did an amazing thing, but it really built our testimony and it encouraged us to continue on with what Jesus had already done. And so here, the 72 come back, they were sent off with good news and they come back with good news. Guess what, Jesus, like, man, it was awesome. But you know what, even like, even the demons at the mention of your name, at the mention of your name, Jesus, they would flee. And Jesus rejoices with them. I believe we should celebrate everything that God does. And Jesus celebrates with them. He's like, oh, that's awesome. <clears throat> yes, I've given you the power over, over the enemy and over spirits. Yes. So I'll Satan fall like lightning. And then he pauses them. He's like, yeah. However... The thing you should rejoice most about is that your name is written in heaven, right? This is the core of God's mission. The other stuff is amazing and it gives testimony to his power and authority, but that's like the frosting on the cupcake. The frosting doesn't make the cupcake. What makes the mission it's for people to get to heaven. That's the mission of Jesus. That's why he came. That's why he died. And that's why he rose. That we may have salvation through him. And that one day we would rejoice as we get to heaven. Amen. And as they read our names. And we rejoice that we are there with our Savior. And we don't have to experience condemnation. We, we escape hell. And we rejoice that we have eternity with our Savior Jesus. And this is the core of the mission. And Jesus wants them to really take a look and remember why they were sent out. And we believe that Jesus has the authority to do that. He has the authority, of course, to, to, that, G, that demons would flee at the name of Jesus. But it's not so much that when we say the name of Jesus that demons flee. It's, it's more about the relationship of the person saying that name and Jesus in the book of Acts chapter 19, we see the sons of Sceva. And they, the Bible doesn't say specifically if they were part of them or they had maybe just heard what was going on, but they tried it. They tried confronting someone that must have had a, a spirit or a demon. And they tried saying, in the name of Jesus. But nothing happened. In fact, they were beaten up and their clothes were taken away and they ran out totally embarrassed and it wasn't because Jesus power wasn't working at that time it's because they really didn't have a relationship with Jesus and so these 72 that went out they knew Jesus they knew him they knew what they were teaching and preaching at its core and that's when at the name of Jesus things flee so Jesus is helping them focus as they return and as they rejoice. And he, he praises God at this time. He gives credit to the Father. And he tells them that what they are experiencing, many prophets talked about it and didn't get to see it or hear it. It's truly an amazing thing. And now in our days, we get to experience the same thing power of Jesus, his power to save, to heal. We have what many had looked for for many years. We get to experience the Messiah. Many look to him for many years, but we have the opportunity to personally know him in our hearts. We have a purpose in life. Our first purpose is to know Jesus to be his sons and his daughters. But also our purpose is to tell others about Jesus. Ephesians chapter two, verse eight through 10 says, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. 
For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God has prepared in an advance for us to do. Jeremiah 1, 5 says, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. And I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. These two scriptures were written specifically for certain things that were going on at that time. But I believe there are also principles for us today. One that God has created us with that very purpose to not only be saved, but to do good works that, you know what, he prepared in advance for us. We have that purpose. We get to be part of God's mission. Not only that, but he set us apart to be a prophet to the nations. And some of you might say, man, well, I'm a prophet. Like, prophets bring, like, words directly from God. They hear him and they talk talk about the future, right? I'm not a Jedi, right? Like, I can't, I don't know what's going on in the visible realm or, but the greatest word of prophecy that we can give is the testimony of Jesus. In fact, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. That's the greatest prophetic word we could ever give to somebody is that Jesus, the son of God came, died for our sins on the cross. He died, but rose three days later and now is waiting in heaven for us and that the Holy Spirit has come to live in us. That is the greatest word of prophecy that we could ever get. And God has called us to the nations. He's called us to our neighbors, our family, our friends. He's called us to our coworkers, our our schoolmates. God has called us. And what a wonderful and beautiful thing it is that we have this purpose. This is the greatest purpose we could ever live for, to know Jesus and to share Jesus. Church, I invite you to close your eyes at this time. If somebody in this place says, you know what, I'm not sure why I'm at, I'm at with Jesus. I don't know if I know him personally. And if you want to just today make that decision to know him and that he would be savior and Lord of your life, I invite you to just raise your hands. I wanna pray out loud with you. Yes, we see those hands. Church, can we pray this along with them? Can we pray all this together? Jesus, we thank you for what you've done. That you came, you died for my sin, and you rose from the grave. Jesus, come into my life, to my heart, my mind. I confess you as my Lord, my Savior, my Jesus. Amen. Can we give a round of applause? If you made that decision today, you can text our Stone Church text line. Uh, You can text uh, that you've made that decision. But as well, I'll be standing here. I would love to meet you. I have a gift for you. And I want to continue to pray with you. But church, I also want to pray with those that perhaps you felt like these, maybe these past couple years that uh, you've kind of just have not felt a true purpose in your life. Perhaps some of you feel that you're called to do a little bit more for God. Whether it be here at the church serving on a team or using your talents somehow, or maybe you feel called to your family, called to your neighbors to be a little bit more bold about the good news. Can everyone say good news? The good news of Jesus. And so we are gonna go into a time of worship. And if if you just feel called today that God has spoken to you, we invite you to come to the altar as just a sign of surrender. You know, Jesus, I'm here. I I receive uh, this call to be your son and daughter and the call to share of the good news. We're gonna pray and we're gonna worship. So I invite you to stand to your feet this morning, church. The altar is open. If you'd like to come forward, you can worship there in your seat. But let's just thank Jesus for all he's done this morning.